Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen to a joined Dota League presentation of Titan vs. Arrow Gaming, a two game series between these two teams in the Asian Division 1 of the joined Dota League and it is going to be an awesome game. Thank you guys so much for tuning in here, joining me Blaze on Dota Talk TV 2 or within Dota TV to yeah, just check out this awesome game and see what these two teams bring to the table. These are, two, the, in my opinion, two top teams. Uh, in Malaysia, the orange is in high contention for that slot, so definitely both within the top three at the very least. And uh, when you consider things like the TI4 qualifiers coming up and the fact that they might have a purely Southeastern Asian division, these are the teams that you're going to be looking for to try to find their slot and find Ten their way to remain. the big event. And uh, right now, I would say that Titan is leading the pack by a little bit. That since their replacement pick. of Miracle with Yamate, they've been looking really strong. They've Dial upped their tempo pick. a lot, and they've brought a lot to the table. But uh, a recent changeover of Johnny in place of Bad Slow Game uh, might still... Uh, Arrow Gaming is kind of working on it and trying to improve uh, their coordination with that lineup. But uh, they do seem to be making some substantial strides in that regard as well. So... We'll see if the, the recent replacement is more of a burden for them, or if they're going to be able to thrive and really make the whole of their new roster. So, kind of looking for the team unification in either Five case here, as both team rosters are within the past two months uh, of age. So, should be pretty interesting to see how that affects their gameplay and their overall strategy. Arrow Gaming have still been looking pretty good, placing top in multiple term tournaments, but Titan really have the most approved with this current lineup. I mean, it's four members of the ex Orange squad from 2013, and then Yamate, who used to play for Orange and uh, is just considered one of the best mid players in the South Asian Asian scene, if not the best. So, we'll have to see how it plays out once we get down to brass tacks, but an interesting draft is proceeding through, specifically on the side of Titan. Like Arrow, the Nature's Prophet ban is a little weird, but the remain. Ancient Apparition ban and the Invoker pick are both very, very Five seconds standard for this metagame. They know what they like, they know what they are going up against, and they don't want Yamate to have the Invoker, but they do want DDZ to pick it up. That's Rolla, by the way, um, having an alias for DDZ. So yeah, Ancient Apparition ban is fine, global strat, Taking it out. But the Lone Druid pickup alongside a Centaur and a Batrider ban. Now, I, I know Titan has always been one for unorthodox picks. I mean, they, they ban out the Titan, Elder Titan, every single time they're not going to get first pick on it, as if it's the most powerful hero in the game. And I don't know if that's because they're reflecting on an old metagame. I don't know if that's a just about their their team name, the way no Tidehunter used to ban out Tidehunter every single game. But all in all, the fact that they're now banning out Centaur Batrider, completely ignoring the other Titan, and picking up a Lone Ten Druid, which really is very unpopular in any current scene. I mean, I know that they can play it well, especially Ohio is one of the more famous Lone Druid players, but even so, it's a little surprising to say it in the first phase of picks here. It looks like they have a huge emphasis on push, putting the Lone Druid, the Enchanter, with both having a lot of push potential within the first seven or eight levels of their hero's existence. So. I, I do think the towers are going to drop, and they're going to try to exploit the fact that right now Invoker has very little counter push to speak of in the early stages of the game, and Alchemist only brings something gradual in the terms of the acid spray. It's not like a Keeper Light or something illuminating down waves left and right, so... Yeah, I'm not too sure. This is a Dire Side roster, so it could be a level 1 row strat, it could be a hard push strat, but the bottom line is most likely we're going to be seeing Ohio Lone Druid, and that will leave open X or Net to micro on the Enchantress. And I always try to call out which one is which, but honestly, these guys are such good supports that they can pretty much switch out and uh, interchange seconds, who's going to be playing what, no matter what the circumstances. And it's just interesting Five to see these two supports at work. So probably going to be X running on the Enchantress, but you never know. Anyways, yeah, they're probably going to be uh, picking up some more push-oriented heroes. Maybe another Pugna, maybe, obviously not the Nature's Prophet, but, you know, just adding fuel to that fire, add that early game momentum and that tower control. A Shadow Shaman would be a great support in lane, because not only do you get the Mass Serpent Wards to dis demolish the towers, but you also get a great setup for Enchantress's Creeps to gank in towards that safe lane. You look at it, you get the Hex or the Shackles off, and that should be plenty to set up a Hellbear Smasher's Thunderclap or a Centaur's War Stomp, so... I do think that if they go ahead and pick up the Rasta, they're going to be feeling pretty good about their landing stage, and they will still have that kind of synergetic emphasis towards tower momentum. But we'll see. For right now, Darkseer is banned out. They're worried a little bit about the, the high 
impact wombo combos, maybe the alchemist stun hitting on uh, three or four heroes, maybe the invoker's meteor deafening blast combo, uh, just striking down and <laughs> striking true against a cluster of targets. Either way, they're going to take that out along with the lycanthrope, as they don't intend to pick that up as their safe lane carry. Instead, uh, they have first pick in the second phase, and we'll have to see what they're going to be looking at. Seconds Rubik and Visage Bands, that's uh, pretty interesting here. They're worried about those setup Five supports, the Grave Chill or the Telekinesis being pretty good slows or lockdown abilities that can uh, cause Reserve them some grief. Time. Along with that, the Rubik ban out implies that they do have some spells that they don't want to be stolen. Maybe it's just a, the Unstable Concoction, but more likely, we're going to see some very active spellcasters in next three picks. Maybe Lance will pick up his Weaver that he loves so much and can do quite a bit of work with and uh, doesn't want to be instantly engaged upon by a stolen tele uh, Chikuchi into Telekinesis. Hard to say. There are so many different combos that can be pulled off here, but I think it's a very smart ban strategy since they have secured one of their two supports in the Alchemist, and they're worried about a lane support. They are going to take out both Visage and Rubik, knowing that Titan have their pick of the litter. In the meantime, Titan seem hesitant right now, burning through all but 30 seconds of their bonus time. They are not exactly sure where they wanted to go with this draft. I thought they really had a game plan with this early Lone Druid and Enchantress, but I don't know if they're regretting the fact that they banned out the Lycan when they could have picked it up for themselves, or they're just not sure exactly what arrow are looking for either, and they're contemplating it quite substantially. Of course, they don't have uh, as much direct experience drafting against Johnny, very new to the roster, as I mentioned, and immediately jumping into the captain's seat. You have to also consider the fact that uh, he did play for a chain stack and other teams like that, and they have played against them in the past, but not in this metagame, and it's it's a very different one, to be certain. I mean, the prioritization of heroes has shifted almost weekly, as far as Ten what is the new maybe. thing. What I mean, this centaur stuff, Batrider, I haven't seen that before. Five I seconds don't remaining. dare say I might not ever see it again. Like, that's just really surprising to see. I mean, maybe it's they just got time. beat by it in a pub, and centaur stampeded a Batrider who had a lasso target as is uh, a quite overpowered synergization. I don't know, but I just, I kind of find it interesting that they're either throwaway bands sure. or that they really have this diverse game plan that Dial they feel pick. niche pickups will actually be able to prevent. Anyways, it's going to be Mozen to pick up his Chen for Arrow Gaming. He's going to try to counteract X in his jungle a little bit if they do put out an aggressive stance. Either way, we're going to see some fun little back and forth with the Holy Persuasion and the enchant. Just kind of tug of war with the neutral creeps and kind of trying to manipulate control of that, where they can get their spell cast off, where they can uh, push a little bit more extensively, they can fight more actively, those kinds of things. And remaining. If Invoker goes a Midas on top of that, X is going to be really hurting for creeps. And in fact, he might have to just ignore the fact that he has enchant until he sees Mosin's creeps. Essentially, he sees Mosin's creep. He enchants it, it might be Midas, it might be Persuaded, but at least he did his job to try to take it away from his opponent there. So I, I really think that that'll kind of be what he has to set himself up for in the mid game. In the early game though, of course, he's still going to be focused on his jungle, and Arrow primarily run this Chen defensively, as most teams do. So it's probably going to be a defensive 2.5 lane, uh, run the Alchemist, laning with the carry, and then Invoker in the mid, and we'll have to see for that offlane pickup. If it's going to be the Slark in the offlane, as BSG used to run almost every single time he had the opportunity, or if it is going to be an alternative Ten pickup for the offlane while Slark picks up the mid, or sorry, the safe lane carry. But um, in the meantime, Titan me. picking up a tried and true pick that, as I was saying, sets up just like the Visage and Rubik do, a great gank ability by the Enchantress. You disrupt a target, Dying Enchantress team. is right there, pounding away with her her enchant slow and her melee neutral creep getting in range for those big spell casts so that would net a lot of first blood against any hero that wasn't slark but the problem is slark has dark pact and pounce and the the nature of disruption is that as soon as it ends you still have plenty of milliseconds to cast that dark pact so it sounds a lot more difficult than it is but you just spam that q you're going to be able to get out scot-free in Five most cases seconds remaining so, 
Yeah, Titan. Gonna be only having two seconds for the last pick. They burn through a lot of time, and they really Radiant may be regretting that fact. The fact that they ticked through so much time in this second phase, because now in third phase, they're countering out the Slark, and they don't have that much time to deliberate whether this is the right choice. And oh, what a choice it is. Bloodseeker, guys. Competitive Bloodseeker is relatively unheard of until Slark was to be considered the most OP hero, and then suddenly people jumped in and said, we gotta deal with it. We have to be able to negate his self-healing with the passives of Bloodseeker, and the Five fact that he really remaining. can't pounce out and run for the hills when he is ruptured up also can be uh, quite a problem. So it is, yeah, a direct counter, like I said. But I'm curious if they have anything more along those lines in the strategy. If Blood Rage is going to be put on the Spirit Bear to dish out that much more da damage to the towers, I'd love to see that because it doesn't really have any spell cast to speak of. Um. Yeah, no, I mean, I definitely think that you could see this as a good utility. I mean, this is actually the big deal for uh, Bloodseeker. The reason you pick him at all is to get that passive against Slark, but now that he's on the field, you really have to make use of what you've selected for yourself, and I think it really comes down to this Blood Rage. It purges, um, I believe, uh, positive effects from your opponent and negative effects from your allies, and then it gives this massive damage increase at the cost of being a silence. So you look at base damage, you look at their primary attribute, or in the Spear Bear's case, all of his damage, essentially, other than th that from items. And yeah, you can amplify that twofold at the minimum, and really just hammer into your opponents in that regard. So we'll see how effectively they get to use this spell. They have two purges now, Demonic Purge, as well as the Blood Rage but uh, not really that many Ten big seconds. buffs. The big buff that you'd be looking for is actually, I'm not sure what one that they considered. Test Five of Faith is a remaining. very powerful spell in teleporting uh, uh, people home, teleporting people to safety, but most people don't realize that it is purgeable in that duration. So you send somebody home, uh, if it's maxed out, you have three Prepare seconds to purge battle. them. And if you do dispel that buff, they're not going anywhere. They are locked in place. And that's actually a huge boon, so Blood Rage, Demonic Purge, both able to take that off the table, and we'll have to see how quick on the trigger Yamate and Net are going to be. But a very interesting draft concluded with Lance picking up the Slardar, and I am very excited to see how this is going to play out. Um, it looks like they're going to resign a safe lane solo, for, uh, courtesy of Xiang Zai, but let's go through formal introductions just to get a better grasp of what we're looking at here. Thank you guys for tuning in to the Join Dota League Asia Division. This is Arrow vs. Titan Game 1 in a two-game series. Looking over at Arrow Gaming on the side of the Radiant. Playing the carry is Lance on the Sardar. Supporting up is Johnny on the Chen. Mosin is actually alternating over to the Alchemist. And Xiang Zai is going to be running on that safe lane Slark that leaves, of course, DDZ, Cornelius Rolla, and the mid lane here, going to be going for an Exhort Invoker with that Null Tally startup. So the, the interesting shift of roles is that Xiang Zai used to be playing the support, primarily the Alchemist, while Mozen used to play the Chen. Now it's going to be Johnny to play the micro-intensive support, begins. and Mozen's just going to be the follow-through. But on the side of Titan, right, looking nice. over at what they're bringing, we do see it's going to be Yamate, current alias NWP, on the Bloodseeker, starting off with a Bassy Ring, interestingly enough. And that is going to be him on the Bloodseeker, leaving X to micro it up on the Enchantress. A couple of clarities to maybe get some early Nature's Attendance out. Down on the, over on the mid lane, it's going to be KYXY, carrying it up on the Lone Druid, but in a mid roll versus Invoker. Pretty interesting there, considering the right click damage of the Bear is 33, Lone Druid is 51, and DDZ is going to be 58 on average. So. Nultal I certainly got a lot of favors along with these three Exhort Orbs, but most of the action is still going to be up on this top lane as CS goes back and forth. Disruption is going to come out though, they steal the Troll Summoner, they're going to try to go for the net here right on top of Johnny, but a defensive crush is going to try to get him out. Is it enough? Yes, Johnny will live with 50 HP, but Mosin is now being tracked down with uh, the Disruption coming off cooldown. They actually probably, if they wanted to chase him, could have gone for this kill. Again, 13 seconds left on that Disruption CD, and they're both 295 movement speed. I think they could have gotten that kill if they were very dedicated. Going for the disruption, going for the troll trap, that would have been a dead alchemist, but they didn't want to go on a wild goose chase there. They will let him kind of catch the fish and throw him back in. Small fish. 
But anyways, uh, to conclude my introduction of Titan, looking down on the offlane, it's not going to be Ohio on the Lone Druid. It's going to be him, uh, DD, uh, sorry. It is going to be KYXY in the mid Lone Druid, and Ohio is going to be running an offlane clockwork 1v1 against the Slark. So, very interesting to see this. Uh, not exactly what I expected, but still quite formidable in its own right. The problem is that Xiangzai is already getting a huge advantage in this lane. Doesn't even need the Orb of Venom to try to get this kill, and one more right click. He's going to do it! First Blood without Orb of Venom. Just a couple of great right clicks, 21 stolen agility, and a perfect pounce right on the money. We will see him TP back down to the bottom lane while a smoke gank is gearing up in the mid. Gonna go ahead, Hellbear Smasher behind lines. Uh, is this concoction gonna pop early? No, he's gonna get it off on the cold snap. There's a Hellbear Smasher, huge damage coming out, and that is a two kill advantage for Arrow. The second one going towards the Chen. Very, very nice movement there. As far as the ba Spare Bear status, he still has the resummon available, so no harm done there, but gonna be losing out, of course, on the experience in this mid lane. and gonna take some hits on his tower as well. Of course this does mean that Lance is pretty much solo on this offlane. You can see that he has still found 9 CS despite of this fact, but it isn't the safest position to be in. If Enchantress is anywhere nearby, they can try to disrupt him out and pin him down. And against a troll, Dark Troll Summoner net, that is not gonna be, the sprint's not gonna be doing him any favors there. Anyways, good movement from Arrow, honestly, to start things off. I love that smoke ink movement to try to pin down the Lone Druid and give DDZ the start that he's looking for. Already finding his boots, getting a double damage rune secured for himself. This is what the supports really do need to do to make sure that they're on point. Now we do see Lance duking out with Yamate a little bit. He's trying to peel him off the creep wave so he can't heal from last hits or denies, but it looks like he'll still get a couple denies. Oh no! Ned actually accidentally takes it with the Shadow Poison. And Yamate is still hurting with no HP regen items to speak of. Now Yamate is just trying to control the CS, but finally Yamate will get one precious last hit. And that will set him up towards uh, a healthier landing phase. Net just trying to zone him out a little bit. Spamming out that Shadow Poison. Lance doesn't have a magic stick, so it does hurt if those stacks keep on connecting. But it doesn't hurt nearly as much as these ganks coming through from Arrow and KOXY. is just not used to this mid position. Now we do see the net coming out onto Johnny under tower, that's gonna hurt. And Concoction's not gonna work out for the Lone Druid, against the Lone Druid perhaps, but in the end, no blood will be spilled except for possibly Mosin over here. Gonna get caught out by the rank three battery assault, too much damage coming in, and yeah, he is certainly gonna fall for the first kill on the board for Titan here. So, leaves Yamate to duel it out with Lance, but now that he has filled up his health bar with that blood path, he is going to be looking a lot better off on this 1v1 lane. But yeah, very interesting movement here, and uh, like I said, it might chalk, I might chalk it up a little bit to KYXY's inexperience on the mid lane. Usually he's farming on the safe lane, occasionally he's in an aggressive try, but as far as getting ganked from the mid, the positioning is... Uh, the slightest misstep could really put you in a vulnerable position, and, but it looks like he's learned from his mistakes. He used his position as a bait so that when they came in, the rotation of his allies, the Shadow Demon and the Clockwork, were able to get a return kill while he walked away high and dry. So, good movement from KOX5, good movement from Titan as a whole. They will secure themselves a kill, but in the meantime, Xiang in a bad spot here. He needs to, oh, pop his ultimate, but misses on the pounce and is now in a very aggressive posture. Is gonna, it does have his ultimate, so he's just going to try to head out into the Fog of War and get that HP regen, but there's the Thirst passive. There is the Vision from Bloodseeker, and Xiang Zai is not going to heal until he reaches his base. Oh, how frustrating that must be. But on top lane, we're going to see kill action back and forth. Lance is going to be the first to fall. Net not going to drop down to the Acid Spray, and they're going to pursue to no end. Under the tower here, Mosin has a concoction in just two seconds, but it's two seconds too many, as Yamate will secure that last hit and get two more kills on the board. Like I said, Shadow Demon dropped low, but was able to still survive, and X is going to heal them up with these attendants. Only rank 1, but like I said, he does have those clarities. Now, Nat just will TP on home for safety. Speaking of going home, Xiang Zai took the long road, and uh, that aggressive dive is now something that he can't afford to do anymore. He realizes, yeah, I, I can try to mess with this clockwork as much as I want, but you can't really bait with your health bar. You can't just say, okay, I can drop down a 20% HP and then Shadow Dance, because if you're below 25%, I believe, it might be still 50%, I'm not sure on the, if it's classified as invisibility since it's it's changed, but either way, when you're below that thresh health threshold, you're not going to be healing at all from your Shadow Dance passive, and that's, that's a brutal, 
outlook to have as a Slark who relies so much on that HP regen. Gonna take a few hits here. Lance should not be able to get a kill. He doesn't have a point in bash, so no RNGG here. But getting baited in a little bit, we'll see the Observer Ward. We'll give Lance a false sense of security here. That's a Radiant Observer not spotting up the smoke. And now the disruption will come. They're going to follow it up with the Centaur Stomp. And this should be a kill. He tries to go for the Crush. He gets ruptured up. And he is locked in place. D just trying to fight it out. In the end, the Enchantress will snag the kill. So, very nice movement. Great use of Smoke and Deceit. And, uh, really, it's gotten its bang for its buck this game. Like, every single time these guys smoke, there's there's action happening, and they are really Denied. making their gank Denied. presence known in this early stage. But, speaking of, now we see Ohio picking up level 6. He's going to have some good mid-range initiation with this hookshot. As, oh, okay, we're going to see it right here, right on top of DDZ, locking him inside the cogs. He will eat a bit of a sunstrike, and in the end... DDZ will just try to eat his way out of the cogs. Now, though, turn around. Xiangzai will happily lap up that kill as they connect with the concoction, but they aren't going to be able to get any follow through beyond that. They're just going to go in with the Centaur, with the Forge Spirit, and try to take this tier one. In the meantime, up on the top lane, no neutrals to speak of for X, but they're still able to hammer down on this tower. And there's really nothing to stop them from taking it, as far as I can tell. So, this is going to be a trade off. Xiangzai could try to jump onto KOXY here, but we've already talked about how. His dives are all the more risky up against that Bloodseeker. Anyways, tower dropping down to half HP, but this one's already gone. And if they do fortify and try to defensively cheap E, they might be able to get something for nothing. We'll see. Right now, it looks like the supports are considering it. But, yeah, here we go. Bloodseeker coming in on the front line. Test of Faith home for DDZ, just in case he gets ruptured up. But again, you gotta watch that Blood Rage. Obviously, Yamate is right now focused on the tower, but... I really do think that there's going to be at least one point in this game, assuming Yamate understands the power of a purge effect, that they think that they're safe, that they think they get ruptured in place, and uh, Johnny's like, oh, you're fine, I'll send you home. And then the second that happens, it, get pur it gets purged. And then suddenly they're like, they're just sitting there, they're twiddling their thumbs, waiting to come home, and suddenly they, they miss out. We do see Xiangzai going to be able to get a nice kill on net, most likely. Disruption, just a moment too late. Ah, uh, in mid-cast animation, but no hope for him there. Disruption TP wouldn't have even worked. He was just such low HP in the channel time. That's too extensive. But there is, it is an all bad news for Titan, although they are now being hunted by this Slark. They did get the deny on this mid-tower, and they got the top as well. So that's like two wins for them. Already giving them a nice little gold advantage, uh, hovering around 2,000. It's not the most substantial, but... It's it's a nice little thing to take it to a mid game when you feel that your draft is kind of at an equal resonance as far as it, uh, mid game impact. If Lance picks up his blink dagger anytime soon, I think I give the edge to them just based on initiation. But we've already seen Ohio hookshot once. We'll see how good he is with the follow through after that with his new shiny high definition clockwork model. Only slight modifications, but it, look, it looks pretty pretty. I still notice it. I guess I can talk about item progression for a little bit here. Right now, KOXY is going to be trying to go for a Radiance, saving up 2,500 gold, looking for that Sacred Relic as early as possible, and still should find it around that 17-18 minute mark, which is all too common for a well-farmed Lone Druid. We do see Bloodseeker and Enchantress looking for an opening. They don't even need to enchant to get a kill, because essentially you rupture them in place, and they're not going to be going anywhere anyways. They will spot out a couple of their opponents, but realizing that there are too many. Oh, did they spot the smoke? Dire Vision? I don't think they did. It's hard to say. But um, we'll, we'll obviously see based on KYXY's movements in the next 10 seconds. Because if he doesn't get out of dodge immediately, he is going to be pounced on. And yeah, he is going to TP down to the bottom lane. So whether they saw it out directly or they're just playing it safe, either way, good movement from Titan as they now look to take this tier 1. And in the meantime, a wasted amount of time Going into the dire jungle here, they're going to have to fall back, start pushing, realize it's too late, and they're going to lose another tower. So they're going to have to fight down here. Xiangzai already kind of waiting it out, getting 
hit by the rocket flare by the shadow poison. And it looks like Yamate wants to go on him. He does pounce into the tree line, but they do get some vision here, there. Uh, it's going to be DDZ to be ruptured up. A lot of damage forthcoming. They even force staff him for some extra nuke. Entangle proc on him. He is certainly a dead man walking. But now getting the silence on Mosin so he can't stun, they're going to be looking to try to walk away with that, I believe. They've already exhausted a lot of cooldowns, and they don't really have the full potential of 5 on 5. So, yeah, unless somebody oversteps and they rebound with a hook shot, they're just gonna walk away with a very solid invoker kill, Dyer's as well as some t tower substantial tower attack. damage. So really good decision making from Titan. Keeping KOXY safe, getting a kill on the solo mid, albeit one that has the Midas and can still kinda keep that golden experience rolling even with a death or two. But right now I just gotta say that Titan really are stepping up their game just a little bit, having a small edge in each one of these teamfights. And if that Radiance comes out anytime soon, KOXY is going to be Radiance looking to be a monster in the subsequent attack. fights. It puts Blink Daggers on cooldown, makes it very difficult for Slar the Slardar to maneuver as well. It's just, uh, we've already shown that they're willing to silence up those big spellcasters. The Alchemist, the Invoker, limit their influence on the team fight. And, uh, interesting 4-staff pickup, I I'll Radiance have to say. Bloodseeker picks up the 4-staff here and... Uh, although I would, like, in a pub setting, if you're talking, like, trench tier, whatever trench tier is, 2,000 MMR or something, if you see a Bloodseeker, an all pick, immediately the second he gets into the game, pick Bloodseeker, and then start building Force Staff as his first item, you're just going to see that guy, and oh my gosh, he's using it as half a Dagon. He's just going to use it as a rupture, and then Force Staff them away. And that is truly one of the minor utilities of it, as I'll get to that point after this fight concludes. It looks like no casualties will be expended. Push going on top and a good maneuvering from both sides, to, uh, specifically Arrow, to uh, avoid that attack. entanglement. But anyways, as I was saying, when you see a Bloodseeker at very low pub status, Picking up a four staff, you're gonna essentially see that used as half a Dagon. You're gonna be like, okay, he's gonna rupture and four staff every time. But you have to consider this is one of the most high utility items in the game. And although yes, occasionally he will use it for that extra nuke just to get the heal from the kill. Um, occasionally, oh, Sang Zai, not a good spot for him. If he gets hook shotted right here, oh, he doesn't even have a TP. They'll rocket flare him, and they're just gonna rupture and four staff to try to get him in a bad spot. Ohio is going to have to get it closer, though. Now they're right on top of him. He will not be healing, and he will be dropping down. Does expend his unreliable gold, so doesn't lose a lot, but all the more for Titan to gain. Anyways, but yeah. So, the Force Staff is a high utility item. He can use it for a movement controlling type thing. He can use it to dodge the Slithering Crush. He can use it to get the Lone Druid Bear into position. I mean, there's so many different things you can do with it, so... In a pro setting, you have to look at all the aspects of the item rather than just the, the one classic one, which is, hey, if I hit level 11, I can nuke a, a decent amount and not have a terrible mana pool. But beyond that, four staffs active is a very high utility thing that Yamate, of course, is a skilled enough player to take advantage of. So we do finally see Lance picking up his Blink Dagger here, as well as Xiang Zai will be looking for a Shadow Blade. But beyond that, the item progression is kind of stifled from both sides. Urna's Shadow's picked up on Shadow Demon. The Sacred Relic finally out on KYXY's Bear. I say finally, as he's able to acquire about a 16-minute Radiance, which is still insanely good. But, um, you know, we've been, we've been expecting it for some time. This is expected of these guys at this stage. Uh, beyond that, uh, Aghanim Scepter will be the pickup for X in the relatively near future, though I think it still will take a bit of time before they, they get on their feet with that one. As far as net worth values right now, Bloodseeker leads the charts with, so weird to say in a pro game, but 6,100 net worth, 6,000 net worth as well on KOX class, so they really are leading the charts, but the three follow-up, the three cores for Arrow aren't looking terrible. They do have essentially their bread and butter. They have the four staff soon to be coming up on the Invoker. He already has had the Midas for several minutes, and the Slaughter does have that Blink Dagger. So they are able to fight. We'll just see how effectively, as so far Titan have been taking the engagements by storm. Not dramatic, like, 
Five for zero swings, but just every single fight coming out slightly ahead. And now we're going to see the engagement that Arrow did not expect. But Lance is a great double crush on the back line on these supports. The Hand of God comes out, and Ohio is getting dropped down heavily. The concoction comes through. The right clicks will finish him off. And Xiang Zai is on the hunt. Untouchable 4 is helping out X just a little bit here. But if a pound connects, he's still dead. And there will be the pounds. He will dodge it just barely. X is on the run, wasting a lot of time. Lance will get the... Oh, negative armor plus concoction. That is going to be a nice kill after the disruption dissipates. And finally, the crush will finish the job. But a great four staff ice wall on top of two. Cold snap down on net. DDZ making the plays happen, and they almost take them all down. We will see him four staff down to the river and pick up that invis room. But my oh my, was that in a tremendous ice wall coming out. Now, KOX wise in the fray, though, he's already taken down Johnny with that Radiance Burn. Looking for Bo as Mosin, his chemical rage, two seconds, he needs to know! He does get hit by the bear! And the Radiance will finish him off. K Naomite on the hunt. Oh, he gets sunstrike by the Invoker. Oh my gosh, that was a great sunstrike. A little bit of a bait, too, by Xiang Zai. He walks, like, right back into the, the crater, saying, hey, this is exactly where I want to position you. I know you want those melee auto attacks to stay on top of me, and yeah, punishes his uh, just boisterous assault. That is, that was quite a turnaround. So some amazing plays from Invoker. DDZ is on the ball today, uh, dropping a, one of the best ice walls I've seen in a month, and that Sunstrike was perfectly on the mark as well. So very, very good for Arrow as a whole. They do even up the kills to eight for nine. Um, but they, the KYXY Bear has kind of flexed its muscle a little bit as well. He was able to get a couple of kills out of that. One on Mosin, one on Johnny. But now we see the Rupture come through. Mosin is locked in place here. And with the silence, yeah, he's going to drop down. They even four staff him to just take him out of the picture. DDZ in a bad spot here. Like, he's trying to fight it out, and he might be able to get Yamate. But you look at his current status, he's trapping Cogs, having to four staff himself out. Young Zion on the hunt, though, will go in with that Shadow Blade and pounce down on Slark. A great crush from Lance as well. They are really just hammering it home right here. Huge damage coming out from these three cores. And like I said, they've got their bread and butter items. They are using it, what they need to make these plays happen. But now Xiang Zai dropping low. The Spirit Bear just needs one right click to finish him off. Four staffed away. He will survive. And Lance now pounding away at that bear. The Amplified Damage setting up the 300 gold bounty for DDZ. Oh my gosh, what the hell happened to this game? It was so passive for the first 12 or 13 minutes, and then suddenly all hell breaks loose. Back and forth, KOXY gets his radiance and wants to fight, 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 alongside his allies, of course, Bloodseeker, always one of the most kill-hungry heroes on the map. But Arrow really showing that they have the potential to swing it back anyways. Despite the radiance, Lance has been able to blink in for some incredible crushes, DDZ, as I mentioned, is completely on point with this Invoker, and Xiang Zai fearless. Now they've got his Shadow Blade, and they really haven't picked up on the detection just yet. Uh, we do see they have Sentry Wards now, but haven't really seen that many placed prior to this. We just look at Dire in general. They have one Sentry Ward here, and they just placed that. So yeah, no, they haven't placed any detection to this point. And that was a really big boon for Xiang Zai, though. Now maybe fueling some uh, hubris, as he might be overextending himself. Anyways, we'll see how they shape up as far as detection goes, because they certainly need to do that if the Slark is going to be kept under control. In the meantime... Seriously? Is this going to be a Dagon 4-staff Bloodseeker? Is this, is this what's happening? I mean, trying to think of the other item pickups here. Yule's isn't terrible. Otherwise, Atos or Necronomicon are the only alternatives with no Aghanims upgrade. Yeah, this is going to be a Dagon or a Necro. And I don't see a Necro being built up. This is really weird. Yeah, I'm <laughs> going to go for the hard nukes. I'm going to try to most likely just pin down Slark before he gets big. Say, okay, well, he's not going for a BKB yet. Just rupture him, four staff him, dig on him, and that's half the tail's gone. And that's going to really hurt his maneuverability. We'll see if that's what he intends to do, but that is an extremely interesting selection for Yamate. On the courier, yeah, it's a Dagon recipe. Oh, lasers are gonna hit the floor, and we'll have to see if it's uh, of the right impact. Because, like I said, he has a gank-oriented hero. He loves to get those kills, but really, it's a, a kind of a short-sighted philosophy towards item build-ups. It's essentially saying, okay, I'm just gonna kill people over and over and over again so that they can't progress in items while well, KYXY does. Of course, he farms extremely quickly with this Radiance Bear. He's gonna be moving towards an AC. 
uh, by the 30 minute mark for sure, maybe closer to 25. Uh, and yeah, that is going to be a huge progression for them, while Bloodseeker's job is essentially just to stop Arrow from progressing, to keep killers on the board for Titan, and to really limit Arrow's potential, but they've shown that they're willing to put up a fight. And uh, now Mosin has three creep camps, as well as a, a very close mechanism pickup. But Lance is going to go in before that's available, and now with the uh, spells expended, they are not actually fully confident in this. We are going to see the concoction hit on an amplified Sunstrike Yamate. Oh, big damage coming out. And they are going to be able to take down the Bloodseeker before the fight begins. Now trying to force out Xiangzai. He pounces away. He gets test of faith home, and they will be able to pin down the Spirit Bear in the process. So... 18 seconds on the resummon, not that big of a deal, but still another nice bounty going to Arrow as they try to force the issue on this tier 2. I'm surprised how well that worked for them considering Lance hit on absolutely nothing with that crush, but showing that they can do so much without it and so much with it. And uh, behold the meatball coming on down, following through behind Lance, and what a combo right here. Seeing the unstable concoction hit on targets that have such armor reduction with this Amplify. Just dropping it down 15 negative armor, Medallion comes out for an extra 6, and that concoction hits like a truck. This thing is hitting for 360 maximum physical damage, but with heroes that are in the negative armor, you're probably closer to like 450, maybe even up to 500 damage if they're as low armor as I think this Enchantress is. Yeah, she only has 2 armor, the Shadow Demon does have 15 with his own Medallion, but this Enchantress gets dropped really hard. So, really a great combo between the Slardar and the Alchemist, getting these amazing high nuke stuns out. And, of course, Young Zai just thriving in an environment where the enemy is on the run. Now, we do see the Rupture come out, but he's just got a TP home, no problem at all. And, in fact, we're seeing a lot of damage on a Yamate. These Ford Spirits doing work. I, I've been talking about Amplified Damage and Medallion as their primary negative armor, but you have to remember this is an Exhort Invoker, actually. Xiang Zai, Xiang Zai gets silenced. He is ruptured. He is Demonic Purge. And there's the Hookshot, as well as the Dagon, to bring him down. So, like I said, a little bit too big for his britches there. Does have to tone it down a little bit when you're considering a 1v5 under Tier 2 engagement, but... Anyways, uh, the other point I was trying to make is this is an Exhort Invoker, and as such, these Ford Spirits trash armor every subsequent auto attack, corroding one armor with the Melting Strikes, and that really does make it very difficult to survive in this situation. The Melting Strikes is just such a huge aspect of their damage right now. You can go up to negative 10 armor. The stacks last for 5 seconds, but they just keep on stacking. And now they got the Necronomicon on top of that. All these summons, a full zoo for DDZ. Uh, half of it smoked up, half of it not. But the bottom line is that is a lot of physical damage forthcoming. Now with an aura to increase the attack speed therein. Now we're going to see the Cold Snap come out on X. Locked in place. He's dead before the fight begins. Yes, nature's attendance, but countered it out by the Sunstrike. Big damage coming out. Yamate, on the other hand, will go on DDZ here. DDZ taking a lot of hits. Test of Faith will not be fast enough. Hand of God a little off the mark. Four are healed and one is uh, dead in the grave, but now we do see a second one, possibly a third falling. Chen got picked off, Ohio on the mark, and there's the Entangle Brock to bring down Mozin. They take down three, and Titan, despite losing their Enchantress immediately, are swinging back. Now, Xiang Zai might find the kill in the net. The disruption is not enough to dissuade him. He'll go on the hunt, and canceling out the urn, getting the last right click. He will be able to walk away, but uh, has to be careful about him. Pretty much he... And Lance are the Sentinels. They're the ones holding the position on this Tier 1 because, as I mentioned in the drafting stage, KOXY Spirit Bear does a hell of a lot of damage to towers. With that battle cry up especially, the Spirit Bear can just hammer through with this demolished passive. And Tier 1s, Tier 2s, they're going to drop quickly. So they have to be very careful about their positioning, make sure that they stay alive and are able to retaliate. Otherwise, there's going to be real problems. So. As I said, uh, I still think Titan came out uh, w uh, way ahead of that. I mean, they got essentially two for three. One Enchantress, one Shadow Demon, both dropped down, but they got so much more taking down their opponents. In the meantime, uh, Mechanism going to come out for the Clockwork after already having come out for Johnny's Chen, but <laughs> answering a little bit of healing with a little more burst. Dagon 3 is up on Yamate. And he's just going to keep ranking this stuff up. He's going to go for all five, as far as I can tell. And yeah, that is certainly a build. 
one that I would uh, I would get flame for and uh, probably flame in pubs because it is just so ridiculously short-sighted. It is all about steamrolling it, it's all about kill momentum, and it has absolutely no prominence towards the late game stages. But for right now, Yamate doesn't care. He wants to kill people, he wants his team to be Radiance having the advantage in the fights now, attack. and as such, they're going to be smoking in. They're going to be going in, probably focusing down on this Invoker. If they can bring down Invoker first in this fight without him casting a spell, that's huge. But first, Lance will start on the bear, gets the crush off. Where is uh, the engagement for Titan? Coming from the flank, look at that Dagon! Look at that rupture force staff, but he still drops the Meteor. The hook shot in, they knock him back with the cogs, he will fall. DDZ is down, and Mosin is getting locked down hard. But will, despite stunning himself on the same concoction, come back swinging. He does get dropped down, but Lance gave him so much space that they were still able to pin down three in the process. Now some impetus coming out back and forth, but a great crush on the almost untouchable Enchantress. Can they finish her off? It looks like they are in full retreat here. The Radiant Spare is back up and swinging. So <laughs> two standing from both sides. What a chaotic fight. I don't even know exactly what to go over in that one. The fact that the Evoker got pinned down, but because he had a small buffer of creeps, Lives slightly long enough to do at least some damage with that Chaos Meteor, but in the end, got uh, dropped down into position behind enemy lines. I don't know, that certainly hurt him, but they still, they, like I said, they still got a lot of damage out. The fact that Slaughter now has this BKB is a very substantial part of that. Being able to just kind of man up on the front lines, just get a ton of physical damage, and uh, really have no fears. No bars held by Lance here. So, great timing on that BKB. They put a lot of eggs in one single basket to bring down DDZ, and although they did accomplish that, he also, his item buildup allows him to be active in the fight even after he himself is deceased. You bring in the Necronomicon, you drop down the Ford Spirits, and you still have those tools on the field after your hero expires, and that's a pretty big deal as he is going to be the focus in most of these fights here. Hmm. Still working on that Aghanim Scepter for X. Any other items to speak of? It doesn't really look like it. Clockwork still doesn't have that mechanism. The fights would be so much better for them if they had this mech, but 28 minutes, and now it's almost obsolete as an item pickup. He finally gets it, and like I said, it is a great boon for them, but the damage that is coming out from Arrow now is miles ahead of that. The mechanism will help out a little bit, and the armor buff plus two will definitely help out with these crazy crazy negative armor stacks but even so I just don't know if it's enough to put them fully back in this game as like I said they're going for a lineup that has a lot of kill presence and they're still down by two kills and that is not a position you want to be in for this roster now Siang Zai will come in towards the pit get hit by the Radiance know exactly what's up actually he just sees oh no he walks in he gets hit by the rupture he tries to pop the BKB and he is healing up with this shadow dance Ohio getting healed up by the mechanism it's not enough to survive the deafening meteor and now they are just going to swarm all over Titan. They're going to be heading out. The bear, it looks to be sacrificed to try to get everybody else out to safety. And that's exactly what will happen, but in exchange for Roshan. KOXY picks up the Assault Karans, but Roshan will fall. And that's if Xiang Zai picks up this Aegis, and you thought he wasn't aggressive before, my goodness, this is going to open up fully, full new avenues of ham. Just going deeper and deeper, going more and more aggressive. But it looks like Lance will be the one to pick it up, and it's still a very solid pickup. Of course, he only gets one life of BKB. The other one will be essentially very vulnerable, comparatively. But even so, he drops them once he comes back swinging, can blink in and get some more awesome, awesome initiations off. So, Kind of just being the linchpin in their lineup, I understand they want to keep him up, just keep that Amplify damage rolling and keep those crushes flying. And... Yeah, I haven't really talked about the Slaughter pickup because we it's kind of commonplace nowadays, but it just does so good in this lineup. The fact that he doesn't expend mana for a means he's able to exhaust a lot of mana on repeat crushes and stacking amplified damage on just about everyone. Yes, Untouchable is annoying. It is rank 4, so it does have 120 attack speed slow, which is a very significant pain for heroes like Slark and Slaughter. When they 
get so much out of the negative armor that it's almost uh, sufficient. You see the Enchantress, then <laughs> take the Melee Necronomicon, and then it's persuaded right back in favor of Chen. But now we see the crush coming out on Yamate. Lance is going deep with this Aegis. They get the defensive disruption to keep Bloodseeker up for a moment, but he still will drop down immediately after. At least I thought he would. But he four staffs away. He pops his Dagon, and he's sending Chiang Zai on a wild goose chase. Meanwhile, Lance taking a lot of damage, impetus, and entangle to bring him down. He'll be but Bloodseeker, Bloodseeker still alive. The Chen will fall, and honestly, Arrow just got routed. Xiang Zai has been tracing this Bloodseeker the entire time, and he hasn't gotten anything on him. That is incredible. Yamate with that jukes, four staff phase boots, and although because it is a wild goose chase, you can't always follow it with your camera, I have to be impressed by him just being alive at this moment. Like, obviously, my focus had to be on the main team fight, but. I really am impressed with Yamate being able to dodge out away from the Slark, who has the Shadow Blade, had that Shadow Dance, and was diving in right next to him. Of course, he missed with that pounce that we had on screen, but even so, Yamate getting away within an inch of his life, and then the disruption coming in to save the day. That is one of the best distractions they could ask for. I mean, the fact that the Slark was taken out of the fight, that Bloodseeker had already dropped his payload. I mean, what does a... Bloodseeker really contributed to the fight after he pops his Rupture and Dagon. Yeah, Dagon's only a 20 second cooldown, he might be able to get a second one off, but all in all, my goodness, did Xiang Zai mess up there. Chasing down the Bloodseeker, he was so greedy for that kill, and it cost him so much time. That was time that he couldn't afford because he needed to be fighting, and they subsequently lost a very big fight. Now Lance getting dropped down for 65 seconds, as that Aegis is no longer protecting his life points. Tier 1 tower will drop, and I believe they're going to go for this second one. Tier 2 is available, and they do have the full resum, and they're using it now. So, yeah, they're going to go hammer down on this Tier 2 in just a moment. But, Xiang Zai's on the hunt. He gets on KOX. Why? Nothing strikes coming down, but they do get the disruption to delay this. And big damage coming out of Xiang Zai, having to pop the BKB inside his Shadow Dance, despite the because of the Dagon coming out. KOX, why? Still dropping low, but he will be able to walk away. No, 4 staff in pursuit. One more right click, and he will fall. 1,000 gold bounty going to DDZ. Uh, Tornado messes up the crush, but it looks like X will still drop down. And uh, trying to pin down Net as well. Yeah, there's going to be a nice little bash to secure that kill. So a great buyback from Lance coming back swinging underneath their tier 2. And yeah, they are able to really make some magic happen there. Just completely turned it on its head. Like I said, Bloodseeker doesn't have a elongated contribution to the team fights. And uh, Titan just kind of got caught out there. Losing the bounty on that monster kill streak. Well, 1100 gold to DDZ and losing the resummon on the bear as it had just been used. 60 seconds, even when he's up, 30 seconds useless. That is pretty huge. And that gold goes right into uh, DDZ's pocket and then immediately over to the shopkeeper as he picks up a scythe of vice. So happy to pick up that monster kill streak as this scythe would have been nowhere near this timing. Mo uh, it looks like Mozum will get picked off though. Unfortunately not in a good position here and exhausting half of Bloodseeker's mana pool, he's happy to be able to claim an easy kill. Dagon 5. I don't even know what if Yamate has thought about his item after Dagon. It's always been just get more Dagon, get more Dagon, get more Dagon. But what do you do after this? I mean, you've just committed to the most expensive item in the game by far, guys. Look at this. We look at, like, a Divine Rapier, and we think it's a lot of money. Pales in comparison to 7,700 gold. Almost 8,000 gold committed to one little laser. Like, if he can get two off in a fight, if he can survive 15 full seconds for a fight and get a second one off, it's almost worth it. But even so, you're just committing a magic nuke. You're, you just get a free finger of death, and while that is substantial... You're looking at heroes that are picking up BKBs left and right and are able to tank more and more as the game goes on. I mean, this is a, a strength larder, gain, strength gain of 2.8, so we already see him reaching 2,200 net worth, and if they do feel like picking up Radiance on any of their heroes, they're going to be able to negate a ton of damage. Wait, sorry, I said that wrong. Uh, train of thought. If they do end up picking up a Pipe of Insight on one of their heroes, they're able to negate a lot of that burst damage, and then uh, everybody else affected by the Pipe will be able to absorb the damage coming in from that Radiance for the full 8 seconds. So, really, if they do pick up a Pipe on any of their heroes, I think they're going to be feeling a lot stronger in their team fights. I'm not sure who would do it, though. It's Alchemist is really underfarmed, only having his Blink Dagger in the past few moments. But going to try to use it here. Ohio gets hexed up. They're going to crush him. They're going to concoction him, and that is going to be... A very unhappy team. 
Now they're going to go in, try to hammer down this tier 3. It has already dropped pretty low, as Arrow has seen this position before. But as far as buyback goes, Clockwork has none to speak of. And dropping in behind enemy lines, a big crush coming out. Ned's going to have to defensively disrupt. No, the Entangle comes through. He's purged up. Lance in a bad spot here. But Yamate doesn't go for the rupture on him, surprisingly. Either way, Lance will still fall. Trying to force back Mosin as they silence him. They rupture him, but the damage is coming out from DDZ. And he's able to bring down Bloodseeker in just one quick meteor deafening. Xiang Zai now, BKB and Shadow Dance about to expire, but they've taken one Rex, they're looking for two, and there's nothing Titan can do to stop them. They walk away with a huge win here. As Johnny survives through the onslaught of the Bloodseeker, a couple TP back to keep their towers alive, and they're looking at keeping Tier 2s alive, while Titan have just lost their Rex. I mean, they haven't lost a single Tier 2, and they just took a full lane advantage. I don't want to say that that's G anywhere near GG yet, because I want to see a lot more of this Bloodsuka laser beams, but wow, is that a huge advantage for Arrow. They are now 12,000 gold ahead, about as much in experience, and the only thing stopping them from taking this game is possibly the Roche respawn being more favorable for the Dire team. No, it's just like, you look at this, and they are just doing so well right now. The way they're engaging on their team fights, the way they're playing aggressively, they're making the use of their BKBs as they get uh, shorter and shorter, shorter in their duration. They have to really make the most of them now, and they certainly are in my mind. Um, but beyond that, the fact that they're they have these frontliners, the slaughter to blink in, the slug to pounce in, this allows DDZ to kind of be a little bit less noticed on the back line. It's kind of like a magical sniper. It's like sniper delivers auto attacks on the back end and just hammers in with crazy attack speed. Well, DDZ is doing the same thing with these spells, just dropping big meteors, big deafenings towards heroes that just can't tank through it. I and mean, this Bloodseeker doesn't even have 1400 HP, and certainly no magic immunity to speak of. So yeah, I, I gotta say that. This has really not worked out for them to this point. Lone Druid can tank through it for the most part. Has a Vladimir's, has his AC. Looking for... Blade Man? Medallion? <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, um... But, yeah, no, he, he has some good items on him, but he's still only one hero, and maybe two Spirit Bears. It's just like, he has his limitations, and they're certainly exploiting it here. Arrow are taking a huge lead in the game, and the items certainly show it. A halberd now available to try to disarm the bear. Clockwork not farmed enough to really make enough of an impact. I mean, you can say that about most of the supports. X has been looking for his Aghanim Scepter all game long. And we're 38 minutes in, and he's still 500 gold off. Net, playing the number 5 role, of course won't have anything, and with this Abyssal Blade now up on the Slark, he's just going to be food. We will see the Brochure respawn going to be taking nearly the full three minutes. Has two minutes remaining on its timer at this point in the game. Wow, this has just been a very interesting game, but nevertheless, Titan resigned themselves to a, a one that's uh, are down in the trenches, one that they have to fight every step of the way to try to come back into because they, they really committed so much to this Dagon and now look at the damage coming out Ohio evaporates Abyssal onto Enchantress he does get disrupted away from that uh, crush but now Yamate getting hit by the cold snap the right clicks and I think that's about to be it Slark jumps in double kill for him triple kill for Xiang Zai as he's able to be set up by Lance left and right a great ice wall as well and KYXY is about to fall kills left and right arrow just completely decimate Titan and now they're going to clean out the base. GG is called for this game one of the two game series here in the Join Dota League Asian Division. And Arrow take it away handily. One last look at the gold graph, the experience graph, before we conclude. A 15,000 advantage in both terms. Uh, I gotta say, it was a nice little showing from Titan, but the Bloodseeker pickup as a fifth pick did not amount to enough. Yamate, I'm sure, had fun with playing it because it's something that you usually don't get to play. But even so, committing. 8,000 gold to a single item that didn't do enough by far. It just, it feels awkward. It feels like they just, lo they keep on losing their tempo, losing their momentum as it comes into play. Like, the only reason I could see a Dagon working is if you have like a Pugna or an AA or somebody that enhances magical damage, maybe even a, a Skywrath. I don't know, but having it on a team that does absolutely nothing but Soul Catcher to improve it, 
I'm just not sold. I just, I, it was a good pickup to mess with Seung Zai in the early to mid game with that passive. We saw a couple times where he had to head back to base just because he was in full vision of this Bloodseeker. But beyond that dr uh, hero counter pick, the item buildup just didn't pay its dividends. Four staff to start, Dagon 5 to follow through. Yamate, like I said, I'm sure had fun, but in the end, it's only a 6, 6, and 10. As uh, Arrow just played out of their minds, DDZ with some great spell cast and some amazing farm as well. If you look at his item set, 686 GPM in this guy, top in the charts by far. Good game, well played. Going next, that was Arrow Gaming taking game one of the Join Dota League Asia Division 1. I am Blaze of Dota Talk TV 2. Hopefully you guys enjoyed in Dota TV or on the stream, and we'll be seeing you guys in game two in just a few minutes.